And as we realize that my negative thoughts is the negative imprinting and belief systems of this world, and as every time I have a series of negative thoughts, it like an alarm clock reminds me to stop and go to the opposite part of my body. The opposite of mind would be heart. I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship. Taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. I'd like to welcome to the show Matt Kahn. Matt, how you doing, Matt? I'm a, I'm amazing. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. We've had a, a wonderful pre-interview conversation that, take, sure. <laughs> that we should have recorded. It was some good stuff in there. It was <laughs> great. <laughs> but uh, I, I truly appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, I'm a fan of your work and what you're trying to do for the world and what you are doing for the world uh, through your books and through your, your teachings and things like that. Um, can you uh, can you tell the audience what is your origin story? How did you find your way to this path? Because I'm assuming when you were six, you didn't say, oh, well, obviously I need to do this. So how did you find your way here? <laughs> yes, when I was six, I had a vision that says you will not be good at real estate. So <laughs> you need to go super mystical. All right, fine. Uh, fair uh, enough, fair so, enough. You know, when I was, um, when I was about eight years old, and around that age, I mean, I, I can't remember most of my life, to be honest. So it's very, but around eight years old feels feels what, what the age was. I, I had a lot of spiritual questions that would just erupt in my heart. I, I had, you know, my, my, my curiosities were in the universe. And what is this? And who am I? And why are we here? And my parents had a background in spirituality, so we could have these conversations. And it was... Um, you know, I was raised in a Jewish family and that never for me seemed to really kind of connect. And I always thought for me, there was just more than just what was, was, was being articulated on any level of religion. And so I, I began asking a lot of really deep, deep questions. And I remember one night I went to sleep and I thought I was going to sleep like any other night. And I found myself in this garden and I've told the story many times, but what's interesting is that Every time I tell it, and every moment, it feels like it just happened. And I'm in this garden. And as a kid in the 80s, I was always really afraid of being without my parents. And in the 80s, there was don't talk to strangers and that whole campaign. Can, and Can you imagine if that was the only problem we had to deal with now? Could you imagine? <laughs> Jesus Christ. You think, I, I just remember that. I'm like, oh, yeah, when I was a kid, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk that, to, was that, that was that was terrifying in the 80s like people were like that was a big like it don't don't be wrong it's still don't talk to strangers of course but there's a thousand other things like a pandemic going on and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and when so. we were kids it was a van it was the van. van it was oh my god they had a whole episode on different strokes about someone that they, they took they took one of the kids in a van it was terrifying, it was, terrifying. i was so afraid of vans <laughs> <laughs> i was so afraid of vans it was right. so Oh my God, that's crazy. Um, so, but so, and when I was in the garden, you know, but I, I had the thought of, I don't know where I am, but for the first time in my life, I feel so safe. I feel so held. I feel so mm -hmm. loved. And I'm walking through this garden where the colors are so bright. It just feels like these colors are just bursting with love. And I really never felt love like that in my life. I mean, I felt love for my parents and my parents are wonderful, but this was different. And I find myself walking through a field of, at that time felt like waist high flowers and I was eight. So I'm sure they weren't the biggest flowers in the world, but <laughs> for me it was waist high flowers and I'm feeling my body push through the brush. And as I start feeling my body move through the brush of these uh, flowers, I then realize I'm hovering above them, floating above me, watching myself and feeling myself move through them. And I didn't know how I was having this simultaneous experience, but the love was so intense. It didn't matter. And then about 10 feet in front of me was this being, in a white robe, dark hair, shoulder length hair, and a beard. And he was hovering above the flowers 10 feet in front of me, motioning me towards him. 
And I didn't know who he was, but there was a familiarity that I felt. And I started floating towards this being to where I'm as close, you know, a couple feet away. And there's just pure white light pouring out of the eyes of this being. And for some reason, what I thought of was in scary movies when people would like roll their eyes <laughs> up in their heads. So I, I don't know why I thought that. Oh, the 80s. <laughs> oh, the 80s. <laughs> and um, as I had that thought, it broke the state and I fell through the garden. I fell through the sky and I fell back in my body. And only once I returned to my body did I, did I realize I left it. And I'm shaking in like a sweat and I'm freezing at the same time. And out of the corner of my eye and in, in my doorway, I see the same being in this like misty white etheric energy mm. motioning me towards him. And I look and the being disappears. And so then I go to my friend's house the next day and I see in their living room, they have this framed picture. And I, th and I went, who is that? My friend's like, Matt, that's, that's Jesus. And I hadn't been raised with an awareness of Jesus. And I go, well, I don't know who he is, but that's who I met in my dream last night. And then my friend, Matt, you did not meet Jesus. <laughs> like as if I skipped the line, <laughs> can't do this, going to hell because you think you met Jesus. And mm -hmm. I'm like, look, I don't know what the big deal is, but that's who I met look, in my dream. That, that dude is who I met. <laughs> Th that dude had a meet and greet. I almost, I almost got a selfie with him. Uh, I almost got a selfie. <laughs> Fair enough. But, 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 but he turned to the other cheek. It was terrible. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. um, but anyway, so I had this, okay, that's Jesus. A and it was just from that moment that I felt angels walking with me. And, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I knew they were angels, but I didn't know what an angel was. So I started having these spontaneous knowings where I would just know things. And I wouldn't know how I would know it, but I just knew that I know it. And it was like the deepest knowing in my heart. And I, throughout my life, these knowings began to grow. Um, the awareness of my guides disappeared. I went into adolescence. And then when I was 18, the, it, it kind of all came back after a series of events. And I began hearing and meeting different ascended masters, archangels, and they would introduce themselves to me. And their message was so loving and the feeling matched the feeling in the garden so ex exactly that I knew to trust this. Because at the same time while I was open to this, I was also in the back of my mind just, okay, you might be a little crazy. Mm -hmm. And so with healthy skepticism, I would talk to the masters, I would ask questions, I would ask the same questions over and over again, just make sure I got the same answers. And I would just have these interactions and then it led to me being motivated by them to go deliver messages to people like at the grocery store and on the street. And it was like the scariest experience of like walking up to someone you're attracted to and that feeling of, I feel like I'm going to get rejected, but this is now like on a higher level of, I'm going to go to a stranger and deliver a message from spirit. And I would, and people would transform and burst into tears. And I didn't know how I was doing it. I just knew how to do it somehow. And it just evolved and led mysteriously to, to the life that I have right now where now I serve the evolution of humanity, and, and I do it with and through the direct guidance of the masters and angels that have always guided me. Now, how do you get to the state where you're talking to your uh, ascended master? The first time it happened, I hear a voice in my head from my main guide, whose name is Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And he says, you're not who you think you are. And my response was, who the F are you? Who, who, who this? <laughs> who dis on the line <laughs> you know that's what i said and and he introduced himself um and be and it, it was just an interesting like i hear guides and i hear angels i hear spirit like i'm talking to you i hear it in my like someone's talking to me and so when the first time it happened it kind of startled me but it felt so loving. I knew to, I knew to trust it, and I would. And I just created the system where it's like, okay, every one of you guys has to have a color and a symbol in my mind, and every time I'm talking to you, it has to always be there, so I know who I'm talking to. And I created a system because I felt the connection. This felt right, but I just still needed to know how to trust it because I, there was a part of me doubting that what I was doing was even real, and so. Mm -hmm. We, we began these conversations and then I realized all of what I was being taught by these masters, whether it was Melchizedek or Mother Mary or Jesus, or it was Kuan Yin or Archangel Michael or Archangel Gabriel, 
were all of the questions I had as a kid. All of the things I wish when I went to school we were studying mm-hmm. were all the things that I was being taught. And so for me, it, it captured my imagination. It satiated that desire to, to know the deepest, highest truths. And it just became this relationship that because it felt like the love of the garden, because it was such loving messages, because it was so supportive, and because what I was inspired to do for other people was so beneficial to them, I, I learned to trust it. So you wrote a book about um, the universe basically has uh, has a plan for all of us and yes. letting go of this plan. I've always said to people, not that I've practiced this, but I've always said this to people, it's a river. Uh, you're, you can either just take the boat and go down the river the yeah. way it's, it's the way, the way, the, in the direction the river is flowing, or you can get out and start walking backwards. Now, I, and, and I, and I, I've done that most of my life, uh, right. while, as most of us do. Uh, but then, uh, what happens is you get tired, you fall down, and the river takes you where it's going to take you anyway. <laughs> exactly. So, what do you, what, in your opinion, what is the plan that the universe has for, all of us. I know each one has a different, but in general, what do you think it is? Well, I think in general, the plan is that all of us came to this planet as a field trip. And and this field trip is where our souls have come to basically undergo training to be future spirit guides, ascended masters and archangels for incoming souls who will go through this education process. So our our destiny, although uniquely individual, just like every guide I've ever met, you know, every master, every guide is like a different specific hue in the rainbow. So each one has a different color and focus and talent and ability. <clears throat> but each of us are here to become heart-centered beings. We're here to undergo and survive the process of surrender, the many facets of awakening, and to truly use this physical form as the space through which we embody our highest actualized divinity, not where our divinity is buffering out our personality, but where we come here to be fully embodied and integrated, um, individualized expressions of spirit. Mm, That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Now, so many times when we're on our path, um, bad bad things happen to us. Yes. Um, Rough patches. Um, uh, And it's part of our, our path. What do you, what, why do you think that we blame ourselves when things bad bad things happen to us that aren't technically our fault? Like we didn't cause it. Like it's right. happenstance that like I got hit by a car. Um, right. You know the, the 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 tax man knocked on the door. I'm like, oh Jesus, what I didn't do? What like something bad financially, physically, emotionally, things that right. are out of our control. Why do you believe that we blame ourselves? Because I know I have in my in my days. Well, first of all, I love that you said like bad things happen because I think a lot of times in the spiritual community or on the spiritual path, people like to self-correct themselves. Like they'll say, oh, this bad thing. And then they'll say, oh, but I shouldn't say bad. I should say. And they try to reframe. And and, and I, I appreciate what you're saying because I actually like to teach a, a, the most authentic path. Whereas we put words that match our emotions. If If to us it feels bad. By saying it's a learning experience doesn't change the feelings already present in your body. So when you said that, I was like, thank you for saying that. Like, <laughs> like, like if I say bad, nope, nope, nope. This was a constructive learning experience. All no, of a sudden my heart opens. No, that, no, that's not no. how it works. Dude, if you get hit by a car, that's a bad thing. A now, bad thing. A bad b- thing. mind you, that bad thing, I always feel that when bad things do happen in your life, that they're, they're there to teach and they're there to guide and many times they're there to protect yes. you from worse things that could happen yeah. uh and like you know you miss the flight but the and you're like that's a bad thing but the flight crashes you know <laughs> these are these are things that you know happen or, or and i've had that happen to me a bunch of times i'm like like uh, i lost the job or i lost yeah. an opportunity that i wanted so badly but yeah. then you know a, a month or two later the company goes under uh yeah which you would have been brought under with it. Things like that. So I'm always, I mean, this is just age too. Uh, an experience was like, you know, when something negative happens, you have to sit back and this is just me, pull back and just go, why is it happening? 
what is this trying to teach me? Where right. is this where is this taking me? Because I don't believe that the universe is there just to beat you up for the sake of beating you no. up. There is karma and you gotta yes. deal with karma and that's a whole yeah. other conversation. But the I don't I don't think that like there's somebody behind the scenes going, ha, let's just Let's see what happens there. Ha, ah, just for our amusements. Like the Greek gods used to do in, right. in, in Greek mythology. They would literally just screw with people just to amuse themselves. I don't believe that's the way the universe no. works. So what's your opinion? Well, I agree. And, and I think, you know, bad things happen because everyone's, it's all subjective. Bad things happen to make more room for goodness, to fill our hearts, to fill our lives. You know, what we think of as bad is an unforeseen circumstance based on how we think life should go. And life shuffles the deck, life mixes it up <laughs> to really show you that things will maybe not go your way only so that you can find yourself going the way that you never could ever think big enough to find, to frame, mm -hmm. to envision. So we can't actually envision a big enough miraculous possibility to ever match where we're going and the path we're already on. So all the, all life can do is consistently disappoint in some weird combination of circumstance. Again, bad things only happening to create more room for goodness to emerge in our hearts. And as we start to lose sight with the way we think things need to be, we start to come into greater alignment with, with the way things are always meant to be, which again, will wind up being so inconceivably miraculous. You will laugh at the fact that you could never have been in charge of finding it because you can't think that big. And that's when we laugh, that's when we open up, and that's when we allow. Uh, preach, preach, <laughs> preach, preach, brother, because I mean, think, I mean, thinking about that, just like in my own life, like when I was, in Miami and I'm like, oh, one day I got to move to Hollywood and I want to, you yeah. know, follow my dreams there. And that was a big dream. And then once I got there, things that happened to me were just beyond my comprehension. Right. And then the funny things are that like the way my path has gone down is like the doors that I've always wanted to go into were always locked. But then through a podcast, they miraculously opened. And I'm right. like, I couldn't have ever thought of that. <laughs> There's right. just no, there's no, well, first of all, podcasting didn't exist back then, but still, the, the, and even things now that I, I can't even comprehend the things that are coming for me. Right. Um, they're too large um, that I, th I think, hopefully, I, I'm being very optimistic. I feel that there's a lot of positive things coming in my life, or even mm -hmm. if they're not big or pot, whatever, I mm -hmm. can't imagine them. Like, right. I, I, I can't imagine them, like where I am sitting today. Right. You would have told me five years ago, I would like, you're crazy. <laughs> and that seems to be the way it's been happening throughout my life. You're like, you're, I would have said you're nuts. I would have said you're nuts. I would have said you're nuts. It's just right. opportunities, people I've met, um, you know, my wife, my family. I would have just said you're crazy. Right. Um, but that is, you're, I've never heard anyone say that. Like, you can't, can't. dream or think big enough for what the universe has in plan plans for you because it's just too much like okay plan the next 40 years that's way too much like you can't <laughs> like it trying to like trying to like you could say oh i'm going to be rich and famous or i'm going to be uh you know i'm going to find my spiritual path those are very broad strokes but try to right. really truly lay out the plan to get there no, of course. I mean, and it's massive. It, it's massive. And, and you know, what's interesting is that this really kind of gives rise to a nice distinction of that's why it's called the law of attraction, not the will of attraction. Like, <laughs> do you think that you have to be in charge of figuring out that plan is uh, a fanciful use of imagination? And what I think is amazing, if we think of most people's dreams and most people's dreams, you know, every dream will be lived out on some level throughout the course of many lifetimes. But if we think of many people's dreams, most people have an envision of a dream. And then if you ask them what it would feel like to live that dream, there's a certain positive emotional state that is nearly opposite from the trauma, neglect, and abuse of their past that they've survived. And so the mechanism of mind prior to awakening is I think things need to be a certain way in my life in order to feel 
the healing benefit of resolving my past. And then we get attached to it has to be that way. And then life disappoints us only to broaden our perspective and to show us we will always feel the way we want to feel. <clears throat> the path will be what it will be. But we learn as human beings, I don't have to force myself to believe that I can only feel that way when specific things do or don't happen. And that's what wakes us up out of fear. That's what eradicates superstition and helps us to really trust that we're always going to find resolution from the things that happened before, right? You have a background in film. What happens in act one is worked out through act two and we find resolution in act three. That's just the way a proper story is written. It's the hero's and journey. Yeah. The, and the, the screenwriting of all of our lives, if we really start looking at it, is so impressively articulate and exact that there's no way that that's not how life's going to work out. Unless we're living at an indie film, which could end at any point abruptly. <laughs> With 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 poor lighting and bad acting. Poor lighting and just <laughs> credits and like they ran out of money. Oh shit! <laughs> Apparently, that's the end of the story. Um, the end. Proper, but, but you're but you're right. Proper stories. I think that's one of the reasons why story is so powerful for for human beings, and and it has been since you know we were around the fire. And, and why all stories are essentially the same. There is that that call to action and, and because we all have those call to actions throughout our lives. We have multiple heroes journeys. We have an over we have a huge arc story plot, which is the our life. But within that there's tons of subplots and going up and down, up and down, which are scenes. Are the scenes of our life, right. you know, which could be a year, could be ten years, but that could be a scene which you're j journeying, which could be, you know, a sp you know, uh, your parents, a spouse, a boss, your career, mm. your physicality, your spirituality. It's all of these things. To try to look, writing a screenplay is probably one of the <laughs> hardest endeavors a writer can do. Right. Try to write the screenplay of your life. <laughs> well, you know what's funny about that because I've taught this before. I was on stage talking about it and I made a joke out of it. And I said, are you living the life of a movie you'd like to watch right now? Uh, right? Like, like would you like to go into the theater and go, you know, coming this summer, watch <laughs> Steve do everything perfectly aligned? <laughs> like, would you want to watch that for two hours? Like, no. You'd, you'd want to throw popcorn to the screen. Uh, but what's really interesting, if we think about the hero's journey um, and, 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 and the journey of, of how everything is so perfectly, flawlessly precise, when we wake up in consciousness, we first realize that we are the actor in a play that has been writ or actor in a movie that has been written by the universe. Mm -hmm. If we wake up to a certain degree, we start to actually watch our lives and live our lives from the perspective of the director's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then people have this curious question that go, oh, but if I'm in the director's perspective, could I now start changing what happens? But you know what I call that? I call that still the mind of an actor. Mm-hmm. You have to learn to surrender into the view of a director without the mind of an actor, which makes it the law of attraction, which the law is. It's a law. Everything's going to work out. The universe always has a plan. If you can allow it to move through you, you will find yourself moving towards it at a more expedient rate. But that happens when we start to see from the director's monitor instead of still trying to work this out through the mind of an actor. And and I think also trying to what, what I love when you said that like maybe I could start changing things. <laughs> that there is that is ego as well. Yes. That yes. is that is ego, which is um, our you know, our everyone's um, anchor to carry in this life. Uh, sure. it, and it's something that we all have to fight. And it's very difficult, and it come and it creeps up all the time. And specifically coming from where I come from, which is Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> and you're and you're familiar. Um, there's no ego. It's very ego less there in Hollywood. There's uh, not much at all. Uh, it's to an intentional with. community, really. It's. <laughs> 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 oh my god. But, you know, dealing with ego, what's your advice on recognizing when ego is is taking over? And 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 again, there are parts right. of ego that help drive you. Yeah. You've got to believe in the insanity of doing something. Right. To move forward, and that's ego saying you can do it. But right. then there's also the flip side of ego which 
is very destructive. Um, and Absolutely. How do you, how, what advice would you have to acknowledge that the ego is there, humble, being humble towards yeah. it, but to, to, any tips on how to recognize when ego's popping his head up or her head of up? Course. Of course. Well, I think, you know, I think there's interesting balance in ego. And it kind of touches on something that I will probably teach soon in a more detailed and elaborate way. One of those is in the spiritual community. So, for example, um, there, there are either two kind of imbalances I find in people on a spiritual path. I find they either have too much ego or they have too little ego. Mm -hmm. So if you have too much ego, there's too much uh, hunger for control. Mm -hmm. If you have too little ego, uh, there's, there's not enough participation in everyday life. So the balance is I participate in my life, I look at the change that I can affect, which is my response versus my reaction, mm -hmm. my choices to bring health and wellness to my life and to other people's lives, to be a promoter of well-being, to be a source of inspiration to myself and those around me, and to basically be like a family member to all the people around me in my community, whether I know them or not. That's a healthy amount of ego. Ego is how we identify ourselves as a unique expression of spirit, and ego is how we remind ourselves what we stand for, which then helps us focus on which choices to and to make and not to make based on which options match our ethical values. So that's a proper amount of ego. When we have too much ego, it's I need control. I need to hide from the vulnerabilities of life by having control. I need to get what I want by dominating and manipulating others, right? There's too much ego, and it's very popular for people to talk about that as a, spectr a spectrum of narcissism. Mm -hmm. When we start to get into that spectrum, it's people who are literally incapable of self-reflection or caring about anything else other than their inner personal narrative. So I think what we start talking about when ego rears itself in an unhealthy way, too much ego, I think what we look at is being too attached to things being a certain way because we've associated it has to be that way in order for me to feel that way I want to feel. To really realize that we can feel the way we want to feel and it has nothing to do with what comes and goes. So I think really the question of too much ego is what are the things I am hungry to control? What do I need to happen? What am I afraid might happen without that control? And can I just take my balled up fist, my grip, which is the same fist people use to fight, mm -hmm. and can I start to open? And let the open hands being a space where giving and receiving can flow freely and allow life to tell the tale where I'm focused on participation, but allowing control to be surrendered. That for me would be the balance. Now, how do you, rec what do you recommend when it comes to dealing with negative thoughts about these bad things that happen on our path? Absolutely. Um, there's so much negative thoughts about things and, and, and not only negative thoughts, but negative people and unhappy right. people that yeah. are constantly testing you. They're tests. I look at them as tests. Absolutely. What do you? How do you deal with those people, especially if they're close to you, uh, meaning like their family uh, right. or things like that? How do you? What do you recommend? Well, so you know, in my journey, I know myself as an empath, which means that I, my emotional body is giving me feedback of other people's experiences, and I've had to learn that what I experience is an individual extrapolation of the collective reality, and so. What people people frame in their perception that they have negative thoughts, which means they have taken ownership of those thoughts as this is my condition that I have to personally fix. But what the phenomenon of a negative thought is, is it's the, exper the, the, the experience of a collective societal mentality basically saying in your mind – if I were you, here's how I would think and feel about this. <laughs> because we as empaths are actually transcending social limitations and social barriers and energetic boundaries to take humanity to a level of evolution that's never been before. So when we think there are thoughts, we live in ego in a space of spiritual management. 
How do I manage my thoughts? How do I keep them in check? And then if you have a superstitious ego, you'll think your negative thoughts will cause you to manifest negative things. And then when the thing that was always meant to happen happens in your life, you go, see, it was because of those negative thoughts. <laughs> and now you're in this self-referencing karmic loop where you are sensing the negativity. And when I say negativity of the world, I interpret that as the unprocessed emotional density that the greater percentage of the world has not seen, become aware of, or healed. And as we realize that my negative thoughts is the negative imprinting and belief systems of this world, and as every time I have a series of negative thoughts, it like an alarm clock reminds me to stop and go to the opposite part of my body. The opposite of mind would be heart. And so the mind like an alarm clock says humanity is ready to unravel some negative belief systems and you're an empath aware of this process. When you hear negativity in your head, stop and love your heart. And as you love your heart in response to negative thinking, the mind will kind of relax and slow down. The thoughts will dissipate to reflect to you the empath that you have cleared another layer of the collective imprint by not thinking it's yours to manage, but realizing it is your opportunity to help humanity evolve by loving yourself more, not less. That's a great, great answer, sir. Um, <laughs> now, I, I have to ask, uh, this is just, I, I'm curious on what you think about this, because yeah. humanity um, has changed so drastically in the last 100, 150 years. Yeah. I mean, it's at a level that has been, I mean, it's un unheard of in, in humanity. I mean, Jesus, the... Uh, no pun intended. Um, uh, the Roman Empire ran for a thousand years, but you know, never got uh, a cell phone. Uh, <laughs> never, never <laughs> took our, never got to this place. Not only of physical and technology, but right. anywhere close to the spiritual evolution of you know where we are today. Uh, many would say today's spiritual evolution is not doing that great. Um, <laughs> but, but compared to the Romans, you know, people are aware of things like meditation yoga, consciousness, um, even science is getting involved with consciousness, right. like w literally, you know, with quantum mechanics and yeah. and going into that and, and proving a lot of these things that the, the gurus from India and the, and, the, and the East had been talking about for thousands of years is now starting to be proven as far as uh, energy and all that kind of stuff. What do right. you think has caused this just insane insane speed up just within our lifetime mm -hmm. i mean i remember when there were no remote controls right <laughs> to televisions you know i was right. the remote control for my grandfather uh, he's like go change the channel um <laughs> luckily there was only like four channels so it wasn't that bad <laughs> but i remember my privacy and my phone calls when i was younger was as long as the cord would reach Obviously, obviously, and then you had, <laughs> from the kitchen. Oh my god, and that massive like forty foot cord that existed, and you would just see people walking into a closet and stuff. It's insane. I showed my <laughs> daughters the other day a rotary phone, and they're like, and I just go here. I'm just going to dial my number, and they're just sitting there going, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> I'm like, it "Yeah, takes forever." It's of course there's no so all so it just even within our lifetime how much things have changed. I mean, I remember when my my mother was raising me, she was meditating, she was eating healthy. Those nice. are things that were not, I mean, meditating in the 70s yeah, right. was still pretty new agey out yeah. there. Um, I can only imagine when Yogananda brought it over <laughs> in the 20s right. and the way he looked at that time in life when no one had ever seen an Indian man, let alone, you know, a, a guru. Uh, right. God, can you imagine what he went through? But what, in your opinion, has caused this, this rev up? To where we are yeah. today spiritually and also just technologically and everything that we've, we're going through well consciousness is always the energy of consciousness is an ever-evolving force consciousness cannot stay in a static form it's always expanding growing evolving changing refining so consciousness is the only causation for consciousness and so the source of what is causing this expansion is the very discovery of what's expanding. And so as people become aware of expansion, it brings their attention to, wait, I see things expanding. I think things, I see things are changing. So when we see a lot of change in the world, it's the divine saying, can you notice the change you see? 
if you can notice the change you see, go deeper into that expansion that you have now become aware of and find what is changing. And we find that we as conscious beings, expressions of consciousness, souls in human form, however you want to frame it, are here on a field trip of ever evolving expansion and the reason why consciousness is always expanding is because the more it expands the more the divine becomes fully aware of itself the more the world in which the divine becomes aware of itself becomes a more enlightened society and the more this manifestation of divinity becomes an animated clearest reflection of the creator being and knowing itself in all forms and so we see such cataclysmic change to bring our attention to the very consciousness that is also waking us all up. That's a really interesting point of view. Is as 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 all of us start to wake up slowly, mm. it speeds everything up, and that opens yes. our that opens up things to and channels, if you will, um, to technology, to mm. uh, ideas, to like, hey, let's build a car. Hey, let's build a television. Hey, let's build an iPhone and connect people and all these other things. Is because right. there's an enlightening part of but it's all starting with each of us the more of us the more of us wake up it just it's a chain reaction is what you're saying it is and at the same time while while the consciousness wakes up there are certain degrees of ego that can remain intact and some that have to be unraveled to make more room for consciousness so in this in-between phase we have expanding consciousness and we have patterns of ego so in the meantime, we have this innovation of technology, advancements in technology, which also the ego tries to use to preserve its own um, life and identity by using in very addictive ways. So like in our current society, mm. we have this pressure of consciousness is waking up so radically and ego is trying to keep its grip of reality intact through the maintaining and discovering of new uh, forms of addiction. And, and codependency and patterning. And of course, the ego is going through an unraveling. The ego is meant to fully unravel uh, as an integration, because again, the ego is just the identity with our personal self. We, we, we're not here to buffer that out. We're here just to make that a space where divinity can be itself in its most unique um, expression. Uh, the ego doesn't know that it's being integrated back into the light. It thinks it's being threatened with death. And so we are undergoing an awakening process to realize the fear of death is just an attachment to our known realities, but we are living as beings who are only here to pioneer the discovery of new realities to really see that there is no such thing as death. There is only a doorway of eternal rebirth. And it's not something we can know. It's something we have to live out. So basically, Facebook and Instagram are evil is what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> basically is what I'm saying. No, but no, but to, to be, I'm joking. I'm joking. But but no, but like, you know, these social media, all these social media companies, that is ego. I mean, it's all ego, more so than ever than when we were growing up. With mm -hmm. the everyone has the Instagram life, the filtering, the everyone's showing off. Hey, look at me, look at my stuff. Look, it is insanity. It is insanity. Right. What's going on? Which is, but there's a dual side to it because Facebook has connected the world. Right. I I, I talk to people that I would have never been able to connect with right. without it. But like, mm -hmm. but there's always two sides to each coin. Right. And and with that is like, I mean, it's it is. I'm a, I'm, I fear for my children growing right. up in a society where like this is a thing. Like I, you, you, we, no one, you, when you and I were growing up, there was nothing like this. There was mm -hmm. nothing even, there was no comprehension of this kind of ego. <laughs> I'm, I, I promise you, if this would have existed in high school, oh my God, the damage I would have done um, to myself uh, because <laughs> it would have been brutal. Uh, you know, I can't even imagine what's going on. Well, 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 I think when we were growing up, you know, things that are done on TikTok were just the weird things we did in our bedroom when the door was closed. Right. And, and, no one was and, filming it. <laughs> no, one's, no one was filming it, thank God. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, 
you know, and I use Facebook and Instagram very sure. consciously to, to spread consciousness and, mm-hmm. you know, to, to promote what we're for, not what we're against, you know, and you can use social media in any which way. Correct. Um, it's very popular right now for someone trying to build an audience to take a stand or a side against another side and who's with me, it's us against them. And it's a very classic way of creating, um, popularity through division. And what I want to do is use technology to create oneness and interconnection and cooperation mm-hmm. and unite the world as one. And if technology is the way I'm going to do it, it's just ma- one of many tools. Because, you know, if we think about ego, the most intimate place ego hides is in whatever side we are compelled to take. Mm-hmm. Conscious evolution is not a side. It is the source of reality. It holds space for the healing of both sides. In my work, I I work to heal the victim and the predator Mm -hmm. because that's what is true in my heart. And I, and I, everyone has their own journey and I respect that, but, um, both sides need to be healed. So the most intimate place ego hides in is whatever side you can't help but take the biggest hiding spot ego hides in is it dresses up in a costume called a corporation. Mm. (laughs) And then in that corporation, we have a team environment, a group mentality where you're either in or you're out. And so what I believe we're on the cusp of really starting to see, and I think we're seeing it at many levels. We're starting to see it in small businesses. We're starting to see it in communities. But we're going to, again, consciousness evolves, so it's going to grow. And we're going to start seeing the corporate infrastructure become a place where consciousness can flourish for a magnitude of contribution for others instead of it being where profit, profit, so profit big yeah. can, can be about, you know, a, a, a bottom line where the bottom line isn't the well-being of all innocent hearts. That's yeah. my bottom yeah abs- absolutely and, that, and yeah and it's another podcast altogether talking about corporations <laughs> yeah. um and and what they do in different industries but we won't get sure. into all of that that's a whole other <laughs> oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a whole other world now there was one of your um steps in your book the mm-hmm. golden rule number five uh, well-being is a signal that you are ready to embody your potential yes. what does that mean that's a great question. Because <laughs> I read that. I was like, what? I want to know what that means. I want to dig into that. It's funny. I, I, I write all my books, do all my videos, and you know, I, I flip open something I, I, I've written. And it's almost like I'm reading it for the first time. I'm like, I do that too. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Like, um, I, I, I do like, that. I that. Whoa, did I, did I really? I don't remember that at all. But it's well-being, well-being is a signal that your highest uh, embodiment is ready to be in. What did I say? Exactly. <laughs> well-being is a signal that you yeah. are ready to embody your potential. The reason I can't remember this is because when I channeled the book and I knew I was going to do these ten, or these golden rules, I sat down and told Spirit, okay, it's time for us to do this. And one by one, I channeled each golden rule like in a row. And then I wrote the book. Um, but what it means is, so what is well-being? Well-being, right, is the is the vibration of being well. Being well has nothing to do with your current diagnosis symptoms, has nothing to do with your familial history of inheritance. Being well or well-being is really about how regularly committed are you to taking care of your body nutritionally, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So when you as a human being are aware that you need to be cared for, when your efforts in the world does not put your needs in in, in a back seat or on the back burner, so to speak, and when every day you're pursuing your ambitions, you're furthering your desires, but you're doing it from a space of balance, of harmony, you're putting, you know, to the best of your ability, high quality nutrition into your body because you're feeding your body with the best to bring out your best. When you are committed to serving your well-being because you know the interconnection of consciousness means the better I treat myself, the better people's worth becomes, which means they'll start treating themselves better. And if we're all treating ourselves better, we're going to start treating each other better. So really, 
taking the journey that says, regardless of the shape of my body, the plight of my circumstances, regardless of a diagnosis or whether I'm in death's doorway or I've been given a second chance at life, when we are committed to every day asking ourselves, what do I need instead of what do I expect from other people, emotionally and otherwise, then we start to be the embodiment and we become the announcers of well-being. We become the ones that in balance start to become more aware of spirit dwelling in all forms. We start to then be the, the Paul Revere messengers that say, hey, well-being is here. Spirit mm -hmm. is here. All is well. Spirit is here dressed up as every man, woman, children, shape and form. And then more people become aware of that spirit within them. And as they start to feel the well-being of spirit guiding them from within, they become more inspired, more worthy, and more excited to take better care of themselves. And when we take better care of ourselves, we're going to become much better caretakers of our beloved planet. Mm -hmm. a, 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 yes. Pre again, preach. Preach, 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 <laughs> preach, 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 my friend. Now, there was um, one thing in your book also that you touched upon was was his anger, yes, and the poisoning of uh, poisoning energy of anger. What yes. can you talk a little bit about how damaging it is? What we can do to kind of alleviate that? How can you, you know, send love to someone who has wronged you in one way, shape, or form? Mm. How, how it's it's a very difficult thing to do. You have to be at a certain level of evolution. Even those times, you're just like, mm. I just want to slap that guy, you know? <laughs> because it's so much easier to do that. Because it's harder sometimes. I feel, especially yeah. in certain situations, it's harder to love than it is to to be angry and uh, and to lash out, if you will. Yeah. Um, but what's your how how do you deal with that anger? Well, what's interesting, so what is really angry or anger? Anger is like a, an inferno of frustration. When we're angry, we are frustrated because there's something that has happened, whether it's this is happening outside of my control or this is a level of dissonance that is opposite of what I think should be happening on a societal level, right? This isn't right. This is unjust. And when, when we, at its highest level of usefulness, Anger can inspire us. And anger says, if you are upset by something you see, what consciously are you going to do about it to be the change you wish you were envisioning? As Gandhi would say, be the change you wish to see. Now, it takes a lot of conscious evolution for someone to have that kind of ability to use anger to inspire their inner artist to bring greater resolve to the planet. Like, oh, I'm angry. I'm going to start a nonprofit. Like that takes a, there's a certain shift that needs to happen. In the beginning, this fury of intensity, this fury of anger, if we think of anger, it's almost like I see something that doesn't make sense or, or, or bothers me. And instead of use, knowing how to use that anger in a productive way, I, I store it within my body and I emotionally light myself on fire. That's what anger is. When someone's angry, they are lighting themselves on fire. And we do that metaphorically because we light ourselves in fire because we say, I don't know how to comprehend what I'm seeing. And I metaphorically light myself on fire because I don't want to be here and I want to go home and I'm trying to check out. So anger is, I don't know how to cope with this. I don't know how to deal with this. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to get out of this dimension because I'm done playing this game. And well, what we realize, by the way, when we are in anger is – we don't reframe anger. We don't try to look on the bright side of anger because we'll get there when we get there. What we do is we say, and this is part of my radical teaching, I accept that the anger I'm feeling is here. I accept there's a reason for my anger. In the future or shortly thereafter, you know, this moment, it will inspire something very tangible, practical, and meaningful for the world. And that will be a positive thing. But in the meantime, can I be the witness of my anger? And can I realize that instead of trying to turn anger into love, can I be the one that loves the angry person inside of me? Because when I am this angry, I am in need of the most amount of support that only I can give to myself. Well, if I might quote um, one of the greatest gurus of our time, Yoda, 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one of the wisest, obviously. Yes. Uh, he said, or George Lucas said, uh, fear leaves the anger, anger leaves the hate, hate leads to suffering. So yes. the core of anger is fear. And I, I agree with that. I mean, I know it's a movie yes. and we're, we're gene joking, but fear right. is the core of all anger. You know, it's, it's either the two cores of any emotion is fear mm-hmm. and love. Right. Those are the two, correct? I, I would say it, it really does come down to all of that. I would say, so I, again, in my little extrapolation, I said fear, I said anger was the, the inferno of mm-hmm. frustration. Right. Frust, frustration means things are not going my way or I don't know how to get my way. And when we don't know how to get our way, yeah. we are afraid that we won't get our way. We've gone off course. Mm-hmm. You know, then we go back into blame the victim. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. What have I done wrong to cause it? Who in a past life was I to cause this undue harm to myself? Wow, I must have been an evil dictator to past life. Whatever our in, <laughs> our imagine, right? We're, we we all were not Genghis Khan, but we all believe we're this. all we're all famous people and i mean obviously you know we're all genghis khan we're all hitler we're all somebody I, I literally i'm still waiting for this i tell this joke 10 years ago i'm waiting for someone to come to me and go matt i remember the past life i was either a manhole com- cover or a pigeon like <laughs> i want someone to remember something completely erroneous and insignificant right. it's never happened um, <laughs> although I'll tell you, I've met a hundred Harriet Tubman's. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm um, <laughs> but who was a beautiful woman. Yes. Um, but it really does come down to fear and what, okay, then what is fear? Fear is the innocent tendency to forget that you are spirit, that you're connected to spirit, that spirit always has a plan for you, that spirit is always guiding you. When you remember spirit, there is a wholeness and a well-being that carries you even throughout environments where you don't always feel your best, Mm -hmm. even throughout environments where you don't think you're doing your best. But there's something guiding this along. It's kind of like um, the remembrance of spirit is remembering that you're sitting in a movie theater only getting sucked into the screen because that's what you paid for is to be one with the story of the characters on the screen. Fear is forgetting you're sitting in the theater and now thinking your life depends on what the characters do and don't do. What I, I, you use the theater um, uh, analogy, Yogananda was he said this so beautifully, where he's like, we are focused on the movie being played in front of us and all the the hurtful and the and death and anger and all the other stuff that happens in a movie but where you should be focusing is the light that's projecting it that's right and you need to go look at the light and find the light that is projecting all of this anger and hate and death and and negative stuff as well as positive stuff but it is all just a movie the truth the truth is in the light that's projecting it and you know, it's interesting because I, I, I taught this at a retreat once and just, it seems like the perfect time to kind of give this like analogy. Mm-hmm. So imagine we're sitting in a theater. This is the journey of life. And we're watching this movie on the screen. And at a certain point, you know, I, we're sitting in our seats. There's a screen in front of us and there's distance. Now imagine the screen widens, right? It widens like a rectangle and both of the edges connect behind your seat. So 360. So, so now instead of being in an audience seeing a screen, the screen is around you and you call it your reality. And now you're in the movie while still sitting in a seat. And then you're in a theater where in the other hallways different movies are playing and we call those parallel dimensions. Mm-hmm. And every person in the seat around you is a different version of you living out your exact life in a, in a different or a drastically unique way. And so through this analogy, I mean, we could take it as far as we want to go. The play of life is that we came here to animate into reality the unique, infinite tapestry and characteristics of spirit and form. And the way in which we get to those greater qualities is by working out all the other you know, evolutionary density that we've only taken on from the past, only to clear a, a giant pathway that is going to make life, life as we know it, into the most magnificent story and play and and movie we've ever truly seen. So we are actually all together transforming this movie. We are doing it by remembering spirit, 
because that's really what fear is about. Fear is the forgetfulness that we are spirit interconnected as one, and we only forget that to go on a journey to have something to remember. Mm -hmm. And if the journey was all, um, I always love using this analogy, it's like if you, if you just went up to play baseball and you hit a home run every time, perfect yeah. home run every single time, the first five, ten, hundred home runs might feel really good. After a while, you're going to get bored. Gonna get bored. So you're gonna start figuring some other stuff out. You're like, maybe mm -hmm. I should do it uh, with my eyes closed. Maybe I should do, and you start trying to get variation. So even mm -hmm. if you had all the fame in the world, all the money in the world, all That's this right. and that, that other, the, the other, um, uh, other um, interview I did with Paul Salzman, who was uh, lucky enough to meditate with the Beatles yeah. in India in the '60s. Uh, I love using that. I've said this on the show before, and it was just so profound. He was talking to George Harrison one day. And George said, hey, I'm, I have more fame than anybody else in the world, which he did at the time. Right. Um, I have more money than I can ever spend. <laughs> um, there has to be more. Right. And that's why I'm here. And that's what a lot of people who are reaching out to, like, I need a mansion, I need money, I need <laughs> fame, I need, which is what Western societies, honestly, that's the American dream. Right, that's, that's what objects, things, stuff. Right. Uh, I always like saying, there, I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. Like it doesn't. <laughs> that's really funny, actually. But it's the truth. You can you can yeah. use that. I've never seen I've never seen a, a, a hearse with a U-Haul behind it because you can't take yeah. it with you. So there has to be more. Um, and that's what I I find. That's for me at least. Um, that is what I've been looking for. That's why I started this company. And that's why I started doing what I'm doing is to dig into this and to go, wait a minute, there has to be more to this because right. tomorrow, um, I, I, I love, I love talking to actors sometimes and, and people in our, in, in the film industry mm. because they think they're so important. Um, and they think, you know, like I'm, you know, my legacy, I'm like, dude, in 200 years, no one <laughs> will ever knew you existed. I know. You, like you know Clark Gable is a famous he was the biggest movie star on the planet Charlie Chaplin yeah. was the biggest movie star on the planet there is in another couple hundred years they will be parts of his in the history books but they're yeah. but and in 500 years or a thousand years they might be gone completely right very few human souls are still talked about thousands of years later and there's really only been a few thousand years that they've been writing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, well, and, well, you know, what's interesting about all that, you know, in 500 years, you know, or in a short period of time, no one will know you existed. Yeah. In the in the second in the first breath you take after entering the light and crossing over into spirit, all of your suffering that you've experienced will be forgotten within you. Mm-hmm. But all of the qualities you took the time to cultivate on this planet will live within you forever. And, and to piggyback on the analogy you said about Yogananda, who is also one of my guides and mm -hmm. love Yogananda, you know, instead of paying attention to the movie, see the light of the projector behind you. Mm -hmm. And then when we see the light of the projector, we realized, oh, the light is only projected because it's plugged into something. Oh, it's plugged into something called electricity. Well, where does electricity come from? And where does that come from? And if we keep tracing it back, we find that there is a witness to all of this, a witness within all of us, the witness who is always witnessing through seeing, feeling, hearing, thought, cognition, all of these things. But what we find is there is a witness. There is a witness being aware of itself, but the witness cannot find where it's witnessing from. So the witness is a mystery unto itself, and the purpose is to be that mystery instead of trying to solve the mystery, but to just know that you are a question mark, not an exclamation point. Um, beautifully, beautifully uh, said, sir. Uh, beautifully right. said. Um, just Yoda. Just Yoda just, coming through. Yeah, it's obviously, obviously. <laughs> um, with, you know, the whole concept of your book is letting the universe you know, has a plan for you, letting the universe guide you and all of this. Yeah. Faith. Yes. It is a problem for many human beings, including mm -hmm. myself, um, where you, you have this, like, <laughs> you're just like, the world is burning around you. 
Oh, yes. And we've been there, and like everything is crashing down, and you've got to go, I'm going to be, I have faith that we will, what I need to have happen to mm-hmm. me will happen to me. If yeah. that means that I get engulfed by the fire, it's part of where I'm supposed to go. But, and that's an extreme example, obviously. But just when things aren't going your way, to have faith that things are going to move forward, you are going to be taken down the correct path. How do you tap into that faith when you're tested so often and throughout right. your life? Right. You're always constantly being tested because all of us have had a really great patch. Like, man, things are kicking. Everything's going right. Oh, my God, money's coming in. I met the perfect guy. Yeah, you know, yeah. everything is good. Oh, my God, yeah, my yeah. career's blowing up. I feel great. I'm healthy. I got a six-pack. I feel like I'm 20 again. And I'm then back, baby. I'm back, baby. <laughs> and then something happens to test right. you. and the, Or there's a, a series of things that happen that are out of your control. Like I was saying, you know, it's, and sometimes you're, you self-sabotage uh, yourself. And you're like, everything's going so yeah. well. Let me open up a brand new business in a subject I have no idea about and I've never run a business before just to see what happens. And then three years later, right. you're just like, what did I do? I was fine. Why did I do that? But you learned a whole bunch of things. So it either happens to you or you just have someone idea goes, it's time for them to go off the path. How do you tap into faith that everything's going to be okay, that, the, that there is someone guiding you? How do you tap that into that faith? That's a great question. Uh, I would answer that. Because in every answer, it's only just what comes through me. Suffering is when we put our faith into the things that change. Faith is when we put all of our hope and allegiance into the ability to change. So when we realize that everything will change, but it will only change us for the better. Our relationship is less with the things that will change. If something came to you, it will go. If it was born, it will die. Mm -hmm. If it was created, it will dissolve and unravel. So I think fundamentally as human beings, we're learning to put our faith in change, not the things that will change. And that's really the difference between faith Mm. and suffering is that we are too much aligned with things that will change instead of being faithful in the change always changing and evolving in us. That's great way of putting it i never actually thought about it that way but change Neither. is inevitable yeah change change is inevitable it happens yes. it, everything changes everything gets born everything dies there is a cycle mm-hmm. with all things it's uh you know i forgot who said it. i, th- I forgot it was a famous i think it's william goldman who said mm-hmm. uh no one's getting out of here alive um <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the death march <laughs> yeah, that's like try a food truck i mean it's like it's like we're all <laughs> going towards that, that everybody everybody and we're all aware of it but most of us just go oh that's years away yeah, yeah. it'll never happen to me and then Not there's a me. few there's a few billionaires who are like you know maybe i'll freeze myself and then come back oh god <laughs> like that's gonna like that's yeah, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna freeze my ego and come back <laughs> in the future like that's going to be that's a multi billion that's a multi billion dollar business, I'm sure. Um, is, or or I'm gonna build a rocket and go to space or I'm gonna build oh. a new business and give Gordon Ramsay a new season yeah. of television to put on Fox or whatever it is. But but really, I mean, you know, the fundamental thing is, you know, human beings in ego, and this is not a negative thing, it's just the way it is, are you know, we're attracted to shiny objects. New is exciting old is boring that's you know so and and that's the way marketing kind of plays season premiere coming soon and it's it's human behavior it's it's not a problem it's just that as we evolve things that change are things that change we are the change that is always changing the question is are we afraid of change are we excited by change and only by tapping into that within us which is always aware, inherently present, and changeless. So the witness within us is mm-hmm. changeless and unlocatable, whose will is to only experience itself as a character that's always changing. And the way we actually make contact with that, ch- with that changeless present witness is by giving to ourselves the very energy that changeless witness is always giving to us and everyone, which is love. So by loving ourselves, 
we make contact with changeless eternal witness and we're able to be excited by change instead of intimidated by change and our allegiance is no longer with the things that change but our will to change and always become better even when life seems to be at its worst. Ah, Matt, 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 Matt. <laughs> I have so much to learn, don't I? I mean, there's so many things. I, I could keep talking for hours. Um, <laughs> so um, let me ask you a couple questions I ask all my guests. Um, what is your mission here in life? My mission is to further the ascension of humanity. I'm here as an intermediary between the Galactic Council and earthly human beingness. My mission is to be a portal and a gateway between heavenly knowing and earthly societal living and to help humanity be prepared and to go through a shift where we become agents of change and agents of evolving consciousness and open up to the interconnection we have with all human beings the guidance we have from all of our masters and angels and to really open up to spiritual reality as a reality, not as a belief, not as uh, somewhere we escape when life gets too overwhelming, but literally, and I am one of many people on this planet who is acting as a spokesperson and an intermediary who is introducing and bringing to this planet the vibration, the consciousness, the ethics, and the mentality of an enlightened society that we are ushering in and that's what we call the ascension and i'm doing it with love and is that why we're having i mean there's so much strife so much anger so mm. much stuff that's going on in the world today yes. um is that why is the ego just fighting back we are seeing both the fighting back of ego in its last battle of trying to hold on to its known world but what we're also seeing is the detoxification of the ego as it withers away and unravels its grip and integrates into consciousness. So what we are seeing both is ego fighting to hold on to its position. And we're also seeing that people go through a massive detoxification of unconsciousness or ego. So we're basically living in the world's largest meditation retreat that in such a badass way, the biggest meditation retreat has told no one they're either at a retreat or here to meditate. It's just what we all wind up doing as a result of life guiding us on our journey. And the more we realize the universe has a plan, we realize there's a great purpose to all of this. And if we can all learn to trust in the change within us, by loving ourselves more, not less, and not being so attached and aligned with the things that are always going to change, we find that we go through this process with more elegance and grace. We're able to be more aware of what we need versus what we expect from other people. We find that we're able to shine a light that helps wake other people up to this greater plan and perspective. And we really take this world as a vacuum of conscious evolution and allow every human being to come into the full awareness that we are here as spirit to grow and evolve and truly manifest heaven on earth for future generations. Is there, um, and I have to ask you this out of, out mm. of just curiosity, is there, yeah. are, is there, because there's books that move people forward. I mean, obviously autobiography of a yogi, um, mm. the Bhagavad Gita, I mean, there's so many. Um, is there a movie that came out, and I know the yeah. movie I'm thinking about, in the last 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. that when it came out, it kind of opened up the ideas and, and a lot of the things that you were talking about in a very entertaining, and this is a very popular movie that I'm thinking about, in a very entertaining way, but, um, but really has kind of opened up the idea of consciousness in a, mm -hmm. you know, in another way. Is there any movies that you've come across that have, you said, "Oh, okay, this is, this is, this, this is, this has opened a door. This is, this is taking everything up a notch." Absolutely. I mean, at a certain point, every movie you watch will have that, or every song you hear will be right. But for me, I will say there's one movie that came to mind when you asked the question, and then there's another movie that is my personal favorite for mm -hmm. the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. So when you said what movie came out that really planted this seed, the first thing that dropped in was Wizard of Oz. 
Interesting. That's what I got because I look at Dorothy, the Tin Man, and the Lion, you know, all these characters, yeah. and I look at them as different aspects of ego. Of course. And I look yeah, at the, literally. the shadow, <laughs> yeah. and there's no place like home mm-hmm. and what's behind the Wizard of Oz, and mm-hmm. there's no one behind. You know, like, I, I think there's so much in that metaphor. For me personally, and I'm, and I'm also so interested to see which movie you're speaking of, the movie for me that is my favorite movie of all time that for me is is it mm-hmm. is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory yeah. or Chocolate, with Gene Wilder that one yes yes of course was it Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka? Yeah, 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 Willy, yeah Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory yeah, Chocolate Charlie Factory was with Johnny Depp yeah 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 no no um, no, no no that was no no that was a bad no, no, um, no that, was a, that was a bad dream bad dream a lot, lot, of, lot of forgiveness for that um, but Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with Gene Wilder for oh me my God. Captured my soul. Mm-hmm. And for me, our journey in remembering consciousness, returning to heaven where we are reborn without having to die, mm-hmm. is entering the chocolate factory. The last line of the movie Charlie, you know what happens to a boy who gets everything you wanted? He lives happily ever after. But the question is are we, are we trying to get everything the ego ever wanted? or everything our soul ever wanted. Mm. So first we have to actually find who's witnessing in this, figure out who we are in this, and then we'll realize what's happening is what we actually wanted. But what we wanted is on such a big level, we just have to let the tour be guided and just be someone being shown around the chocolate factory before we go on the glass elevator. Wow. That's, I never thought of Willy Wonka that way, but that makes all the sense in the world. For me, mm. um, I feel that uh, on a, a philosophical uh, and a spiritual standpoint, it's the Matrix. Mm. Oh, of course. Yes. Of course. I mean, I mean the Matrix, because it, it, it brought into popularity the concept of these concepts that really had never been in a major motion picture, not like that, Absolutely. especially no. in an action movie with, you know, Morpheus. what is real, <laughs> what is reality, you know, the one, the, the, this, I mean, he's literally a Jesus, um, you know, to say, you know, he's fighting Smith at the end of the third one. That's ego. He's literally destroying ego and being, being absorbed back right. into the major. Like, it's just the metaphors are, are constant. Um, and and people could say whatever they want about the second and third film, but as a whole story, mm-hmm. the concepts that were dropped in that film just yes. they were like a big stone being dropped in a river, and they just keep rippling and rippling and rippling. Hundred percent. I mean, Star Wars as well to, to a certain extent, but Matrix specifically was just such a popular film. Obviously, it was you know hugely popular film, and it was in you know is wrapped in action and. You know, and and all that and that kind of stuff. But it, there's when I saw the Matrix, I saw the Matrix probably four or five times in the theater. Like I was, I didn't know yeah. what I was watching. I was just like, "What is this?" <laughs> not only just for the, I think not even just for the the action, which was revolutionary yeah. in itself, but the questions it was posing to me at that time in my life. Right. I was in my twenties. I was like, "What?" It's yeah. going on here. Like, why? It, it really did. What did you think? Yeah. I love The Matrix. You know, I've only seen it a few times. Um, you know, I'm personally not a big... What's interesting, um, I'm not a really big sci-fi fan. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I like it, but I don't like... Yeah, go crazy for it. Go crazy for it. I'm, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, like, for me, is like, yeah. that's my Matrix. Especially, like, just because I was thinking about this. Like, in the movie where Slugworth we think is trying to like undermine Willy Wonka and he turns out to be an agent helping to prime Charlie to make sure he's the one. Mm -hmm. And so at the end we find out that the ego is actually an ally and not an, for me it was just, there's so much in that. You should write a, Um, you should write a book analyzing Willy Wonka. (laughs) I will actually, I would, I would, you know what? I, I, this this, don't tell I don't tell that. Um, no, please. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, I loved the matrix, and I think it took me years and years to really see all the seeds that were really being planted. You know, like for me, I, what, I, what I love about The Matrix most is like Neo is one backwards. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. You know, that kind of stuff and looking at these really interesting little... Trinity and Trinity and Morpheus. Trinity, Morpheus, which is kind of like Melchizedek, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's, I love 
how and you could also say the movie you know, like where, where dreams may come with robin williams as oh, another jesus movie. well that's i mean yeah i love that, that movie that, that that's an incredible oh, hero's journey movie. oh um, god i love that movie but you know, I, 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 what I, what I think, and and I love documentaries, and you know, what the bleep and secret, and you know, these things really, really did did help in a lot of ways, on some level. But be, and here's 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 I think the biggest point coming through me at this moment with this question, because consciousness is equally one side philosophical and one side artistic, mm-hmm. the greatest way we can spread philosophy is through the inner artist. So when we see a film, a film can, through the depiction of a fanciful location of erroneous characters, plant seeds that actually grow as evolution of reality inside human beings. I find that to be one of the most advanced levels of alchemy on this planet, is how Mm -hmm. art, through music, through film, through literature, uh, literature through paintings uh through any form of art we are able to like the elders sitting around the fire pass along the stories and parables and consciousness that 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 takes fantasy as a medium that transforms our reality in a more forward direction for me that level of alchemy is inspiring it's unthinkable it's it's sur- surreal and it is only worthy of my deepest bow when I sit back and I watch something and I go, look what you just got through into the atmosphere of this quantum field. Mm-hmm. Well freaking done. Yeah, like you snuck it through the goalie. <laughs> snuck it through so cleverly. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I mean, Star Wars alone. I mean, that just the force, the force, the inner, you know, the uh, you know, finding within everything, the concepts that he would dropped in, and that's why it's still so popular today. I mean, the concepts and the ideas that he dropped in that movie, you know, whether you like sci-fi or not, it, it definitely hit a chord with a few billion people. <laughs> well, I will tell you this, and this is just a funny admission. Very funny admission. One of the movies when I was really, really young that 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 touched me. And you know, for all of us, mm-hmm. there are movies that in all of our hearts, like mm-hmm. there's a, like there's songs on our phones we don't want to admit we have that we see. Obviously. Like. Backstreet Boys. There Backstreet Boys. In sync. Got it. <laughs> I Spice Girls. I'm not afraid. <laughs> Nick, Nick the Block. First concert I ever went to. And yeah, yeah, I yeah, loved, yeah. loved it. Um, so, <laughs> and there is a, there's a movie in each of our hearts that we, we pretend we've never seen that secretly. Like, so when I was a kid, and this is a kind of funny story. So a little backstory. When I was a kid growing up in Torrance, California, you know, in the 80s, people had VCRs. Now, my parents didn't have a VHS, right? They had a Betamax. Oh, my God. And beta. my parents believed the Betamax was the wave of the future. And so we'd go to Warehouse Music, right? Mm-hmm. Warehouse Music or Sam Goody. And you would see the entire store's VHS, and we had one shelf, half shelf, that was Betamax. So when I got sick and I had to stay home, whether I was really sick or just needed a day off from school, my mom would make me a grilled cheese sandwich with tomato soup. And then we'd take me to Warehouse Music where I got to rent whatever movie I, I wanted, which is one of seven movies, because Betamax was being phased out. There was one movie I saw, and I just looked at the cover, and I was always, as a kid, I wasn't enthralled by sci-fi. I was enthralled by kung fu and karate. Mm -hmm. And I saw one of the most terrible movies I've ever seen that at the same time I couldn't help but love, and it became the movie that every time I was sick I would rent and watch. Mm -hmm. And it was called Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon. Well, of course The Last Dragon is an amazing film. I saw it in the theater. I saw it in the theater. Better man than I. I don't think I was old enough for that. The glow, right? The oh force. My, the, oh, the force. It, it's, 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 it's the force. It's the glow, yeah. With, with but, but that for me was like, oh my I was God. Young, it, oh. Was, it, was, it was like, That's so I need to find the glow in me. Oh, yeah. And show, I saw show, enough. Yeah. Show, enough. show enough. Show enough. <laughs> show enough. Don't get me started with show sure enough. Oh, my God. That's amazing. It was, for anyone that's never seen that movie, mm-hmm. please do or don't. And it's amazing. And, 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 and you can say, and I'll say, I'm sorry. And thank you at the same time. Um, but it's, 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 I, for me, it's just one of those things. And it, when I, I remember when I saw it, 
it was just that moment where it got through. Mm-hmm. As ridiculous as it was, and there were some amazing fight scenes that I thought were incredible. Oh, and it, and it was and it was a fairly ridiculous film. I mean, it's, it's fairly, fairly ridiculous, overly overacted, over the top. What was her name? Van? Was it Vanity? Apollonia? Uh, no, no, uh, no. Vanity, the the the, the girl. Oh, oh yeah, Vanity. I yeah. think her, literally her name was Vanity. Um, I think you're right. Uh, so all of that. Uh, it was so over the top, and I. But I understand you, what you mean, especially at that yeah. point in your life and in mine. I was. I'm probably a little bit older than you, but right. But we were. It got the same thing. You're just like, oh, dude, the glow and the music, and oh. I have so, the soundtrack on my phone. Uh, I'm gonna play. I have it on my phone. <laughs> the opening song is like. That's a, that's a great soundtrack. Are, it's great it's soundtrack. like I have the tiger. It's it's one of those. And what's funny is the reason I saw the film. Because I read the credits, and one of the actors in the movie who had a very minor role was Ernie Reyes Jr. Yeah. And when I was in it, he was know, the star of a show called Sidekicks, which of is course. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh my God, Ernie Reyes Jr., who, yeah. who at that time I thought was going to be like the next Bruce Lee. Yeah, I was I, convinced. I, I, dude, I, 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 worked, I worked for the producer who did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So the original. So Ernie was in that. He was also in like Surf Ninjas, I think it was called. Yes. Uh, yes. And he worked on Surf Ninjas. Oh yeah, I, I'm very familiar with Ernie. Yeah, and he's still, like, he's still working. He's still working. He's still working. He's still doing amazing. stuff. Oh yeah. So before I got into like watching MMA and UFC and all that, which is you know where where my heart is going and all this, I was like the biggest Ernie Reyes Jr. fan. And then of course you know, um, Dragon the Bruce Lee story with oh. Brandon Lee and yeah. like th- that movie also um, had a very deep spiritual impact on me. Because I was always very fascinated with Bruce Lee and the mysticism. Everybody and, is, yeah. It's Bruce. It's Bruce. It's, a, it's Bruce. Bruce. It's so Bruce. It's, water. it's like water. it's it's Bruce. It's the Beatles. It's Elvis. It's yeah. Michael Jackson. It's like these are iconic people that you just, you know. To me, there's certain people whose auric fields just transmit this dimension, you know. And one of the greatest compliments I could ever that I've ever received from my work is that there's a transmission of energy that comes through. Because when I was younger. That's what really touched me were things that transmitted an entry point into this dimension. So I'd watch The Last Dragon. I'd watch, the, you know, that documentary, The Bruce Lee Story. I'd watch, you know, and for me, that was my entry point. For a lot of people, it's The Matrix. You know, I loved The Matrix. Um, for some reason, I don't know what it is with me in sci-fi. I just, I don't know. But I, I love how there are just these creations and movies and art that, literally are portals into a greater interconnected higher dimensional of reality and 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 really i think it's at a certain point all of life is just a series of infinite portals because we came to this planet to remember the spirit that's dressed up as the planet and to really take the journey of truly becoming our highest potential Mm -hmm. And, and again fulfilling the plan the universe has for us um, Matt, I know we can at least speak for another four or five hours comfortably. Um, <laughs> comfortably, comfortably. I, I, I will. I will definitely. If you if you'd like to come back on the show, and we can another day, another time. Yes, because, please, thank you. Yes, <laughs> please, because it will be. Uh, I'm sure we can continue talking about many things um, yeah. forever. But um, can you tell everybody where they can find out more about you, your books, your work, and and, and what you're doing? Sure. I mean, my, my first three books, my fourth one comes out next year, but my first three books are available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is www.mattcon.org. That's mm-hmm. M-A-T-T-K-A-H-N.org. Uh, there's an events page of all my upcoming virtual uh, events and soon, you know, in person when that's safe to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter, free newsletter and receive a free activation. And of course, you know, follow me on Instagram. I think my Instagram handle is mattcon1. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, it used to be Matt Con Neo, but I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I defeated the ego, and now I'm Matt Con One. So, <laughs> Matt, um, thank you so much for being on the show, Matt. It has been an absolute pleasure meeting you uh, and speaking to you, and I look forward to our next conversation as well. So, thank you, my friend. Likewise, my brother. Thank you. <laughs>